So after that trip in in sixty one, had you come down here uh, since then? When's the last time you came down here? The first trip was fifty three. The second trip was uh, sixty one. And I'm, I think it was 61, not 62, but I'm not certain of that. Anyway, it was Ron Smith and Larry Allen and down to Bright Angel, and then my brother-in-law, Klaus Axman, from Bright Angel down to Lake Mead, Pierce's Ferry. And that was on 2,500 second feet. Doc Marsden came in in uh, 62, I think it was, the year just before I ran in 63, he ran on 2,500, uh, 40 a number of things was Portiax. Ulrich Martins and I, as mentioned, came in in October of 63 and ran on 1,000 second feet of water. Um. Then there was another trip with geologists, uh, Foos, uh, from back east in 66. And since then? With Ron Smith and the big raft. And had, is this your first time back since 66? This is my first time back. I Nobody could have talked me into running it again except uh, for the work that we wanted to do. I wanted to remember it like it used to be. But I enjoyed this run so much that I don't think it's lost that much. And uh, there's, in fact, a gain in seeing other people enjoy it so much. Uh, could you describe, the, nothing could have brought you back except, you said, except the work you wanted to do. What work is that? Could you tell us that? And I know what it is, but I'm just wanting to get it down for the camera. Uh, the, work of, the work of this trip. Well, what was it? Well, you said nothing could have brought you back down here except for the work yeah. at hand. That's right. And And I would like a description of that work. Well, the work at hand turned out to be just uh, helping Bob and Ted Mellis to get a handle on the uh, things that are happening in the canyon, like uh, debris flows mainly and uh, tourist impact and the influx of the Russian tamarisk and things of that kind. And uh, There's more, yeah, the other thing that I decided to do once I got in to the canyon was to make a continuous photo record of the canyon from one end to the other with 35 mil film. Unfortunately, I missed horn to bass because my camera didn't roll a roll of film through, it was my fault, but I'll have to come back and get that in order to complete the uh, set. But I think it'll be a good set and it'll be valuable for research and other purposes. And I'm going to talk to Ted about and Bob about the best way to set that film up as you and I have already discussed. Uh -huh. um, how, let's see, there was a couple things I was, actually, I want to go back, well, no, as long as we're on this, before we before we shut down, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about Smus Allen and that trip where they stamped that boat on on bedrock. But while we're on the subject, this other deal, maybe we ought to just talk about the changes that. How has this place changed since you know fifty three sixty one to now? Um, you know, when it comes to the work at hand, what what are the most? How has it changed? In the time that you've known it, and how has it, and what's changed, and what's stayed the same? The biggest change is obvious. There are always boats on the river, and the campsites are heavily used. But I haven't found that too negative. The uh, these big walls are never going to change. Essentially, the biggest uh, geologic change has been debris flows. And that's a natural thing that occurred before and it'll occur again and it'll be swept out and it'll be swept in. So other than that, uh, the canyon is still just as great an adventure as it ever was. I 
encourage people to come see it. They won't be the first, but be the first time they see it, and that's the main thing. Um, were the beaches different, like back there in the 50s and early 60s? Were they uh, were they different in size, and, and were there as many tamarisk trees and stuff like that, or is that very noticeable, or does it seem to be pretty much the same? As far as I can tell, there's more debris washing into the river than, like Bob said this morning, than the river can take out. And the beaches seem to be building, the debris at least, seems to be building up. But we need the river to be in here to wash the beaches clean to keep the tamarisk back so it will continue to be camping spots in the canyon. That's the main thing that I see right, right at the moment. The debris coming in faster than the river can handle it anymore. It probably used to be able to come closer to handling the debris coming in than it is now due to the dam. And uh, we need uh, more high flows to wash the tamarisk out and keep them back off the beaches far enough so we have beaches for camping. Do they seem, the, the sandy beaches, are they about the same size as they were? Uh, well, no, I'd say that uh, due to the debris flow, there's more rock in and less sand. And uh, there's less sand also mainly due to tamarisk taking over like they do at Unkar and a couple of other places I've seen. That's, that's going to be, uh, I think Tamaris taking over beaches is going to be one of the biggest problems. Um, do you see any difference in the Bureau of Reclamation then and now? Attitude? Yeah. Yes, uh, I just hear there's a difference that uh, they are much more, they recognize, I think, that they have to listen to the voice of the people, which uh, damn people ignored back in the 50s and 60s until we got their attention. And I think this is a healthy thing for the Bureau of Reclamation and for the people, because we can work together to do what we have to do for energy, but uh, at the same time, have her cake and eat it in places like this through good cooperative planning. Mm -hmm. um, now, back to that hatch trip. Uh, what what was Smuts Allen like, and and could could you just tell us a little bit more about that trip? You know, where because I know you have these pictures of these guys stamped on bedrock, and and that's kind of a historical interest. Yeah, I had too. some uh, pretty good uh, black and whites that I gave to Bob. Uh, Smuts was at one time the mayor of Springville out of Provo, and he, like I mentioned, he ran bedrock with me, and and probably due to poor old Don's uh, signaling us from shore, we went right over the bedrock, which he was trying to miss. But uh, he came down with us and ran the boat that uh, didn't quite make it around that rock, around the beach ahead of the rock. And there was more room at the time than there is now, but the water was shallower out there farther too, so I had a little split on just exactly what his chances were. I suppose there were 50-50 to get by there, and he came up short. He pinned it right on the nose of the rock, and it sunk, uh, probably just went down slow and then flipped under, and uh, washed out a lot of stuff and a lot of dudes, and they all went up on the point of the rock, standing there and busting. I realized what had happened, so we landed on the lower end of the rock, and I ran back up on the rock to the nose and went down the boat and got rope and pull it up and give it to the passengers and they pull the boat up and as I mentioned it split and I sewed it up that night and Smuts jumped down the boat and come up from the river bottom with a surprised look on his face and rode it into shore. One tube was a little flat and the bottom had been ripped out but we fixed it and it ran lava falls and the rest of the canyon just fine. 
but uh, bedrock remains today uh, in the opinion of the boatmen that we've talked to, as well as uh, Don Harrison, my identification of where they're going to have trouble with this trip. It remains the one single real hazard in the canyon. The rest of the rapids will get you, but they'll sweep you out without, usually without maybe more than a bang or two on the boat, but uh, bedrock will wipe you out. Yeah, it's my least favorite one. I, I can't stand that rapid. I hate it. Um, Oh, there was one st I don't know if you feel like telling it, telling this one or not. It's up to you, Brad. Brad told me you told him a story that just had him rolling on the floor about your eye. <laughs> I don't know if you want to tell that for the camera, if you felt like it. He said it was... He, well, I, I parted company with it in an explosion when I was 15 and wore an artificial until about five years ago. And uh, Once, I'll just brief it real quick once uh, got lost in a spud patch and we said a prayer that night and my wife found it way down under spuds on a leaf the next morning so that's a faith promoting story next time uh, I left it on a coffee table and the dog at it I poured the dog full of peroxide and pretty soon it erped in the bathtub and there was the eyeball on top of the erp looking right up at me so the third time was the uh, final one. I had a, uh, a root canal done by a dentist. And he wasn't a root canal expert, so he drilled down through the root and said, I can't get that stuff out from below there, so I'll give you some uh, <clears throat> bacteriological uh, material for it. And uh, penicillin, oromycin, counted off a number of them. Any, meeny, miny, moe. I said, well, oromycin sounds good, so he gave it to me. It caused such a ruckus that it uh, shrunk the eye socket. So my wife and I said, no way. So I started wearing a patch. <laughs> a lot less stressful. Yeah. Well, when I've been doing these, uh, we always forget something. I, or it seems like half the time whenever we do these interviews, we'll sit down and visit with somebody and then shut everything down and get up and walk away. And then and then, uh, 15 minutes later or an hour later or half a day later, I, I find myself going, oh, man, I should have asked, you know, such and such a question or something. And I, I'm wondering, you know, being as how this is going to the archives, what what it is that we're forgetting here. Is there anything you can think of, real, like a topic, you know, just kind of in light of this There's something trip. I think that I'd like to mention in front of the group sometime, and that is, I'll just really brief it here. In this canyon, it was cut down by draining inland seas and cutting a new channel through here to the sea, or deepening it or robbing it, or however. But we know there was a lot of water running through here at that time, and that's what cut the canyon. Right now, it's uh, a, a creating material in the bottom instead of cutting down, so to speak. There's a, uh, an analogy we can draw from a river up north I'd like to bring in in order to visualize what was really happening here. I think it will. The Fraser River, Alan Neal and I ran with a Grumman 17-foot canoe with oars and a paddle, bulkheaded. We started at... Uh, just below Prince George and ran through the uh, Cascade Range. The first thing I want to mention, it was running about three, four hundred thousand second feet. And uh, it had a one foot to the mile gradient and the constant current on it was 10 miles an hour. This is the first thing you need to realize the size gets it away from friction and speed increases. The second thing is the depth and the volume. When we went through the Cascade Range, uh, we made it like 110, 120 miles a day uh, because of that velocity. And it cut through uh, in the Caribou Range before it hit the Cascades, it cut through two granite upthrusts going exactly, turned the river first 90 degrees to the right then exactly 90 degrees to the left. 
And you can imagine that much water make a great big curler off the wall as it turn and then big waves coming into it. And there's a huge boil coming up like a piece of beefsteak about eight feet high above the rest of the river and about 100 yards wide on the inside of the where the water came up from the bottom it turned and went down that two or three hundred feet and came way up in the air and on the inside of the curves is about a 50 foot deep whirlpool we ran through that came on down and uh, portage hell's gate because there is a lot of logs and things running in and shooting up out of the whirlpool they logging through that river and then went on down through the what they call the ballast strait where there's whirlpools in the river the width of the river going through the cascades the, like two great big bread loaves on each side about 7,000 feet high and they just come down to the constant slope and went right to the river bottom about three four hundred feet down below and the river is about 100 yards wide or so and uh, they lost the power boat in the only other run of the river that had been attempted and they run through the uh, hell's gate which we portaged, but they got lost in the Whirlpool Canyon. We were in Whirlpool Canyon because our boat was streamlined. We put the back end of the boat in big old Whirlpool, didn't matter. Whirlpools were three, four hundred yards wide, and I looked back over Allen's head and see the rim up there about 10 feet. Very impressive, but rather, with our boat, it was rather safe. So we, that's the uh, type of thing to give an idea of volumetric flow it was running about 15 miles through an hour through the cascades and about 10 miles through the caribou and uh, run up to 700,000 second feet now the Mackenzie runs a million second feet Mississippi runs uh, more than that so but you can visualize probably it was around 700,000 or thereabouts in second feet going through this Grand Canyon Gorge in a manner just like we see going through these rivers up there now for however many years it took to stabilize and drain those lakes and change the weather pattern from a very wet one to the dry desert one like we see now. That was the cutting mechanism of the Grand Canyon. And when you get that much water cutting through this more narrow chasm in the Grand Canyon, it has tremendous cutting power. And that's what cut the Grand Canyon through all those years was a big river, a lot, big, a much different animal than what we're seeing here. It would be uh, much more violent, but in some ways it'd be, uh, it'd flow a little easier, but down there on the bottom, it'd really be cutting. And the, the velocity through here at five miles, uh, five foot to the mile drop would be great enough to be a tremendous cutting mechanism. Well, you reckon it'll ever get that way again? I'd like to be around to see it. <laughs> yeah, I think it will eventually. I don't see, I mean, unless, I think you gotta stop water from wanting to get to the ocean to stop this process here. I mean, it might be a couple, 300 years or something, but I don't see how we can, I don't see how we can move that much silt, you know, that's that's going into those lakes now as much as the <coughs> natural river did. I, you know, Geologically speaking, I'd go in a blink. Yeah, it seems like it's going to have to, I mean, there's no way we'll be able to keep up with that. But man time speaking is forever. Is that? Why did I decide to go ahead anyway? Because uh, I wanted to remember the canyon like it used to be. But I'm glad I came and see it like it is now, so. What was it, what's the best parts, remembering it like it used to be, what are the best parts of that memory? Wilderness feeding. But you can run it in the wintertime now and get that. So I don't think that's lost entirely. I wonder what it is about that about the wilderness that's so appealing. I think you feel <coughs> feel like you're alone with your maker. You feel like you have less outside 
influence disturbing you, you can commune with whatever the powers be that formed all this a little bit better. But uh, you set it up right. That's the main thing. Anybody can come down here and find a time when they're alone if they really want to and prepare themselves for it. Uh, just one last word and then I know you guys want to fold up here. And that is that uh, when I ran the canyon first, and I want this to be an example, I'd never seen it, but I knew every rapid in it uh, from one end to the other by heart and everything about the canyon. You don't have to know it quite that well, but you should do the best you can to know what you're getting into before you get into it. And you should have your equipment in such condition that whether you come out or not, that equipment is going to come out okay. Then you don't have to worry about your equipment. All you got to worry about is yourself. And then make sure that you're in pretty good condition. And after that, not before you got the license to run the canyon or wherever else or to climb the mountain or whatever you want to do. Be prepared, in other words. Uh, you said you knew every bit of the canyon by heart. How'd you know that? Did, did, you did uh, a lot of homework before you came? Where? Well, you said before you came down here, you, you really knew. Uh, well, I made the maps. I had an advantage over other people because I memorized from the maps too, but I would have done it anyway to a certain extent whether I had the maps or not. So you'd get the USGS maps before you came down here and just yeah. lay them all right, just right out exactly? Well, I made my, made my scroll map before I came. Mm -hmm. And was that the work of, uh, was that the Eddie trip, you know, or, or who? That was 1923 uh, contours that I used that expedition. And that, those are the ones that them guys surveyed, not aerial photos or any of that. They were made uh, and taken only as the contours that would go to the head of whatever dams they were proposing. Mm -hmm. So they'd propose a dam and draw the contours to that level. That's why they're really skinny in here. They only go up these walls a few feet right in this section and see the few skinny little lines out there. I probably should go back in and take the uh, other contour maps and uh, cobber in a few more contours. but. Uh, I don't know whether to add or subtract, so I haven't done it yet. Yeah. Jeff? Most, of, most of the canyon, the contours are quite high. Can you think of uh, any questions? What are we forgetting here? What's your favorite favorite section of the river? That's what that we. Oh, the Grand Canyon? Yeah. That's a little difficult to say. Uh, I love that section of the river between uh, Crystal and Bass and Walsenburg, actually. And I love the uh, strip from Hans through uh, Zoroaster. But maybe my favorite canyon is from separation upstream to about 205 miles, just below where all those ripples are. That, in other words, the third granite gorge, I think is probably my favorite. It's kind of the vest pocket version of the whole thing. And that's what I like to run after this in order to complete my photo record. How about you, Karen? Can you think of anything else? That gut. <laughs> Do you remember what you thought when you first saw the canyon, either Glen Canyon or when you came on down to Marble and Grand Canyon? Do you remember kind of what you first thought when you first saw it? You've done your homework and you were here. The unfortunate thing about running on small boats and running alone and also trying to do something that will, you know, fast. Is you don't have to, enough time to look around. So that's why I'm looking around so much now. 
the two go together, I figured, well, I got to come back when I got more time to look around, do things than I had on that trip. You, you gain one thing and lose another. So it takes, that's why we took more time on Ulrich Martin's trip and did a little better job of photography and things. We hiked up quite a few little canyons. Well, okay, senor. Thanks for tell. Thanks for doing this. That was great. God, that was fantastic. Well, uh, I hope you can cut a few things out of the worthwhile. <laughs> I think we can. Good enough. That made me ball a couple of times. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.